Welcome to this series of narrated PowerPoints which cover the very last topic of the Year 12 Biology course. By now you should have managed to work your way through most of the uh, content for the Ecosystems Workbook and that, th for that there were a whole range of PowerPoints and various different tasks and past paper questions. I will have posted the answers to the past paper questions on Insight for you and um, if you look in the resources tab you should be able to find them and you'll be able to mark them yourself. When we do get back to school I will obviously give you an opportunity to discuss any of the problems that you might have had with that topic. We're also going to make sure that uh, we give you a bit more practice and of course there will be an end of topic test so that I can check that everybody has managed to make sense of it and knows what they're doing with the, uh, the more difficult style of questions. Obviously at this stage I have no idea when that's going to be but it would be good if we could try to get that done at some time within the next couple of months. So just make sure that you've completed all that work and that you have um, completed all the tasks that, that they asked you to do and um, I also need to just let you know that there will be some PAG tasks to do with the topic as well. We have to do some um, surveys of um, populations and that type of thing outside uh, which I had originally organised a field course for but probably that's going to have to be rescheduled or we might have to do it locally. Either way we'll get those done. One of the things we didn't quite finish before the end of term were the statistics and the math skills. So we will have to go back over that and that, we, that will be to finish the uh, topic on variation. We, most of us have done the variation and the classification but there was still some things to get through in terms of the math so we'll be getting through that um, in lessons because I feel that we need to have an opportunity to do that with you. So this last module, module 4.1, is the very last topic for Year 12. It's very appropriate considering the reasons why we're having to do this online. And what I've done is I have provided narration for all the PowerPoints. And you will also be given on Insights some worksheets, questions, and you'll be needing to use your textbook. As you can see, you'll be using pages 302 to 337. Obviously, you can look at online resources as well. So the learning objectives then for this first lesson. You can see that we've got two main aims of this lesson. We're looking at different types of pathogens that cause disease. So that covers bacteria, viruses, protoctists and fungi. And you can also see in the list there are some named diseases for each of those different types of microorganisms and each of those diseases is something you're going to need to read up in your textbook and find out something about. You've got a sheet which um, allows you to summarise the main points of each of those diseases and um, this is so that you've got a working knowledge of all the different types of diseases that you could be asked about and you are expected to know which type of microorganism causes each type of different um, disease. The other type of uh, part of this lesson is going to be on transmission of pathogens in animals and plants and the difference between direct and indirect transmission and also that will be referring to things like vectors and spores and various different living conditions. You aren't expected to know symptoms of each of the diseases above but you're obviously going to need to know something about the way in which they're transmitted and the ways in which therefore their transmission can be controlled. So let's start with a definition of health. If this was something that we were doing in the lesson, I would ask you to analyse this statement, health is merely the absence of disease, and evaluate whether or not that was sufficient to really describe what health is. And I suspect probably most of you at GCSE have already come across this, this uh, definition, so you probably realise that it wouldn't be sufficient in this day and age. So. The World Health Organization states that health is a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So that allows everybody to include the fact that it isn't just about whether somebody is physically ill, it can also 
include whether they are suffering from mental health problems or whether they've got they're suffering from some kind of social disease and um, things which would be included in social disease would be things like alcoholism um, and perhaps things like obesity as well so all of those things would also come under that heading and they can actually contribute towards people being um, unwell so if we look at this list on the next slide if you're in good health, you're likely to be free from disease, able to carry out all the normal physical and mental tasks expected in a modern society, well fed with a balanced diet. And well fed with a balanced diet means that you are neither overweight or underweight. So in fact, although a lot of people don't realise it, being overweight is also a definition of malnutrition. Usually happy with a positive outlook, which so that obviously refers to people's mental health. And um, I'd just like to point out with this one that people's state of happiness can be affected not just by um, the th events in their life, because obviously most people have good things and bad things, but also um, it can be, a state of unhappiness can be generated by imbalances with chemicals in the brain. And so that is a physical cause of, uh, of mental health problems. And um, it's often in the past been um, confused with people being sort of generally optimistic or pessimistic and it really we shouldn't think of it that way. Um, very severe depressions for example can be caused by imbalances in, uh, in the chemicals in the brain although obviously that can also be caused by life events as well. So suitably housed with proper sanitation and well integrated into society so people who for example um, are homeless would not fall into that category and would therefore not consider be considered to be in good health. So this brings me on to this question. This is a part of a um, one of the old spec questions and let's have a quick look at um, the thing the way the questions worded. A 50 year old man who regards himself as in good health was asked by an insurance company to answer a series of questions about his health. Here are some of his answers to the questions. So he smokes 20 cigarettes a day, drinks at least 8 pints of beer a week, mostly on Saturday evenings, plays football in the parks on a Sunday, drives to work, spends most evenings at home watching TV, rarely eats fresh food and vegetables, father died of a heart attack at the age of 45, and Using that information, you are asked to explain the statement health is more than simply the absence of disease. And that's only for three marks, so um, not a huge amount of information uh, required to get those three marks. I would say that most people would be able to evaluate the information that's been given there in that question to actually come up with a reasonable answer. So what I would suggest you do is at this point pause the... Um, the video have a go at noting down what you feel you would write down as, an, as a really as an evaluation of this and link it to this idea of health is more than simply the absence of disease and make sure that you refer to that statement once you've done that go on to the next slide because I'm going to provide you with the answers so having a quick look at the mark points for this so lifestyle increases susceptibility to degenerative diseases, so things like diabetes, coronary heart disease, and atherosclerosis. Smoking increases the risk of developing lung cancer, co um, coron uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, and CHD, coronary heart disease. No sign of symptoms of disease may be developing or increasing risk of developing non-infectious diseases. So even though he he may not actually seem to be unwell what they really mean is that, that actually that that could be developing unseen and the person might just suddenly become unwell father's heart attack may mean there's a genetic predisposition to heart disease he's not eating a balanced diet has very little fresh fruit and vegetables very little dietary fiber um, not sufficient amounts of antioxidants or vitamins virtually no exercise during the week and except on one occasion a week, he may put strain on his heart um, if he goes and plays sport once a week. Health risk associated with binge drinking of alcohol. So really what we're looking at here is that he may not seem to have the symptoms of disease, but actually 
judging by the, if we link back to the, the World Health Organization's definition, he's clearly not as well as he should be. So just have a quick look at these six diseases on the page. Measles, coronary heart disease, gangrene, potato blight, Alzheimer's and malaria. So the question above says, what is a communicable disease? So out of these six diseases, which, if any, are non-communicable? So hopefully you've been able to identify that those two, coronary heart disease and Alzheimer's, are non-communicable diseases, leaving us with measles, gangrene, potato blight and malaria. So what we mean by a communicable disease is a disease which is caused by a pathogen. A pathogen is just an overall name for any microorganism which makes us unwell. Lots of microorganisms actually don't make us unwell and in fact lots of research in recent times has shown that quite a lot of microorganisms are in fact beneficial and necessary for good health and we're actually only really just starting to find out the, the important role that they play in maintaining a healthy body because by providing us with a, what we call a, a, a microflora. Pathogens including bacteria, viruses, fungi and protozoa and they're all represented here on this list so we've got examples of each of those on this which we're obviously coming on to a bit later. So the next thing we're going to think about is how pathogens actually make us ill, so how they cause us, cause us harm. Now as I mentioned before, not all microorganisms actually do cause us harm and we are surrounded by microorganisms all day and the majority of them don't actually affect us in a negative way at all and in fact in many ways they can be quite beneficial. So pathogens cause us harm in two ways. Firstly, they can actually damage the tissues in the body or they can start to release chemicals into the body which can interfere with our processes and can actually make us ill. So those kind of toxins and poisons actually circulate and interfere with our normal body processes. So first of all then, damage to the tissues. So this is very simply where the pathogens get into the cells and destroy them. And um, they quite often do this because what they're going to do is they're going to use the cell's apparatus to actually make more of themselves and also to use the materials to build copies of themselves. And of course this then um, disrupts the normal activity of the cell and then the cell itself is uh, broken up and, it, and in the breaking up process it can actually release a lot of toxic material into the system. This is exactly what viruses do and this is one of the things of course that um, there has been a little bit of information in the media about with um, COVID-19 because the virus will get into the system, goes into your cell, get gaining access through quite a lot of the glycoreceptors and um, gets in through the normal sort of doors by latching onto the glycoproteins uh, that you have on the surface of your cell. And um, once it gets inside the cell, what it actually does is it inserts its um, RNA in this case and the RNA is a whole load of list of instructions on how to make a new virus and the cell picks up that those instructions that DNA and reads it and translates it and then uses it to construct new viruses and those viruses then break out of the cell destroying those tissues of the cell and go into the system and of course in the case of the, co the uh, COVID-19 it's mostly the cells in the respiratory system which are being damaged and um, and that's why you put the first symptoms you have include things like a cough and um, sore throat and that type of thing so the the actual virus itself is damaging the the cells which line the trachea and then eventually deeper into the lungs and it seems as if the evidence is showing that the as the virus gets more deep into the lungs the damage that it causes is more serious which might re explain why some people are more badly affected than others. Now one of the other things that happens is that uh, pathogens can release quite a lot of toxic material into the system and these toxins do a couple of things. Firstly they can actually work as inhibitors to enzymes so we know that um, enzymes the ability of enzymes to do their job can be affected by the presence of other molecules and um, these 
other molecules are often referred to as inhibitors and they quite often work as um, non-competitive inhibitors where they bind to the enzyme changing the shape of the active site and then it means that the enzymes are not able to do their job also the other thing they can do is that these toxins can quite often bind to um, things like glycoproteins and actually prevent the normal signaling to go on inside the cell. And a good example of that would be the protein receptors in the synapse. So for example, um, the botulinum um, protein affects the synaptic transmission by binding to the areas of the synapse. And um, we often get a lot of toxins produced from bacterial reactions. and um, Botulinum is a good example of that. So the four main types of pathogen that you need to be aware of are your bacteria, and you've got examples here of TB, bacterial meningitis, ring rot, which is in potatoes and tomatoes, viruses, HIV, influenza, and tobacco mosaic virus from plants, fungi, black cigatoga in bananas and ring, ringworm in cattle and athlete's foot in humans. In fact, actually ringworm is also found in people as well. And protoctist, which are things like malaria and potato and tomato blight. So um, those are the examples that you are expected to know. And you're expected to know um, what actually causes those diseases. So what I want you to do is I want you to use pages 200, so 302 and 310 read through them and then use the sheet that I have also included with this PowerPoint which summarizes these diseases and um, and also these types of microbes and order in order for you to summarize quite a lot of those pages in a much more manageable form. What you need to remember with um, large quantities of information is that you are not necessarily going to be expected to regurgitate all this information in one go but what they would be expecting you to do is to have a working knowledge of the main types of organisms and the ways in which these things are being transmitted around. So the question, perhaps you could get a question, for example, on malaria, and they would expect you to know what type of organism causes it. They'd also expect you to have some idea of how it's transmitted and therefore ways in which you could control it. Very often with data, um, so with um, questions on pathogens and disease, they quite often give you data handling exercises to do and ask you to evaluate information and so on. And something I will be giving you to do as well as a practice question at some point. So the second part of this PowerPoint is the means of transmission of animal and plant communicable pathogens. So basically, how do the pathogens get from one organism to another? So we've got two main methods, direct and indirect transmission. So this refers to um, the vectors, spores, living conditions, climate, and social factors, and so on. You're not expected, therefore, to have the symptoms of the diseases um, for this particular thing. This was in the very first part of the um, PowerPoint, just outlining some of the uh, bits from the specification. So transmission can be direct or indirect. Now if it's direct, what this means is that you are literally passing it from one person to another. So the pathogen is, is a bit like past the parcel, being passed on by touch, so hand-to-hand -hand contact, by kissing somebody, um, if you are sharing needles with somebody, then the blood inside that needle could be passing the pathogen from one person to another. Direct transmission also includes things like ingestion of contaminated food or water. So the, um, the food has become contaminated and you are directly picking up that food and ingesting it. it I have to say this one, the contamination of food and water does feel like it's a little bit in between direct and indirect. However, you need to know that this is considered to be direct transmission. Indirect transmission, on the other hand, is where the pathogen travels from one individual to another via an indirect pathway, such as a vector. So the disease has gone from a person, say to the mosquito, and then to another person. Another expression you often hear, some of you might have heard of it more recently in relation to COVID-19, is fomites. 
So these are really anything like any surface or materials or anything which could have become contaminated. So um, if, for example, you were sharing a towel with somebody, you could pass that bacteria onto that towel and the next person that uses that towel will be picking it up. So it's really sort of, I think the best way to think of indirect is where the pathogen is passing onto something which is effectively not um, not affected by that um, disease in any way but is just sort of hanging on to it until the next um, person or the next plant or whatever it is picks it up so that that, that um, sort of intermediate isn't actually um, suffering in any way the same thing would be for indirect would be um, pathogens passing through the air because the air is effectively hanging on to that, that um, disease without being affected and that's why I say that um, when you think about contaminated food and stuff that can sometimes feel like it's indirect but it is considered to be direct so just make sure you've got that one straight so that brings me to the last slide in this PowerPoint and the last thing I want you to do is go through pages 305 to 313 in your textbook read through them Obviously take notes if you think that might be useful, but perhaps more usefully is to complete the tables which I've provided, which summarise the main points um, about the ways in which transmission occurs. And finally, there are some summary questions on page 310, just to give you an opportunity to practice what you know. So this brings me to the end of the first PowerPoint. I hope you found it useful. And uh, if there, anyone has got any difficulties with this, then obviously do let me know. Um, you can always get th through to me on my email if you need to. Uh, I do apologise if I sound slightly miserable. Uh, and if you've heard some of my previous ones, that does tend to be um, just the way I sound on these things. But um, I will be doing the narrations for the next PowerPoints as well. So um, you'll be able to access those as well in the same place. Thank you.